From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! We've been saying from day one there's been no evidence of Trump-Russia collusion, and nothing in the indictment today changes that at all. President Trump's former campaign chair, Paul Manafort, and his former business associate, Rick Gates, surrendered to the FBI after being indicted on charges that include money laundering, acting as unregistered agents of Ukraine's former pro-Russian government, and conspiracy against the United States. The White House says the indictments have nothing to do with the president's 2016 campaign. But Trump's stopped tweeting yesterday after his former campaign adviser, George Papadopoulos, it was announced he'd pled guilty to lying to the FBI. We'll speak with Marcy Wheeler, who says George Papadopoulos's indictment is very, very bad news for Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Then Democracy Now! goes to Puerto Rico, where the FBI is investigating the $300 million contract between Puerto Rico's electrical power company and the tiny Montana-based company Whitefish, named for the hometown of Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke. It truly is unnerving, you know, that people can just swindle, swindle an entire population when they are at its most vulnerable. As Puerto Rico moves to cancel its contract with Whitefish, we'll speak with San Juan Mayor Carmen Yulín Cruz about her response to Trump's attacks and her vision for the island's recovery. Power isn't just about the power grid. It's also about the ability that the Puerto Rican people may have in the years to come to ensure that there is appropriate uh, economic development and equally divided amongst all the 78 municipalities in Puerto Rico. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. President Donald Trump's former campaign chair, Paul Manafort, and his former business associate, Rick Gates, surrendered to the FBI Monday as special counsel Robert Mueller announced the first indictments in his investigation into alleged Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. election. Both Manafort and Gates pleaded not guilty to all charges filed against them in a 12-count indictment, which included money laundering, acting as unregistered agents of Ukraine's former pro-Russian government and conspiracy against the United United States. The arrest came as authorities announced a third Trump adviser, George Papadopoulos, pleaded guilty in early October to lying to the FBI. Papadopoulos is cooperating with investigators in exchange for a more lenient sentence. According to his plea deal, Papadopoulos was told that the Russians had dirt on Hillary Clinton, and through a series of communications with foreign agents, he tried to facilitate communication between the Trump campaign and Russian agents. At the White House, spokesperson Sarah Sanders said Monday the indictments have nothing to do with the president's campaign or campaign activity. She also said Trump is not planning to fire Mueller, as many conservative news outlets have demanded. The president uh, said last week, I believe it was last week, and I've said several times before, there's no intention or plan uh, to make any changes in regards to special counsel. Uh, but look, today's announcement has nothing to do with the president, has nothing to do with the president's campaign or campaign activity. On Twitter, President Trump lashed out, writing, quote, sorry, but this is years ago before Paul Manafort was part of the Trump campaign. But why aren't crooked Hillary and the Dems the focus? Also, there is no collusion. End quote. The president's tweets came before no news broke of uh, George Papadopoulos's indictment, and Trump has not tweeted since. Meanwhile, Democratic leaders warned the White House against firing special counsel Mueller. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer said in a statement, quote, Congress must respond swiftly and unequivocally in a bipartisan way to assure the investigation will continue, unquote. We'll have more on the Russia probe and Mueller's indictments with Marcy Wheeler after headlines. On Capitol Hill, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and Pentagon Chief James Mattis told senators they believe the Trump administration has the authority to wage war against accused terrorists across the globe as lawmakers review the AMUF, or the Authorization for Use of Military Force, which passed three days after the 9-11 attacks. This is Secretary Tillerson speaking to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and potential repeal of the 2001 AUMF without an immediate and appropriate replacement could raise questions about the domestic legal basis for the United States' full range 
of military activities against the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and associated forces, including against ISIS, as well as our detention operations at Guantanamo Bay. Tillerson told senators any new war authorization should have no time constraints or geographic restrictions, meaning the U.S. can attack wherever and whenever it wants. On September 14, 2001, the AUMF passed the Senate 98 to 0 and 420 to 1 in the House, with California Democratic Congress member Barbara Lee casting the sole dissenting vote. Since then, it's been used by Presidents Bush, Obama and Trump to justify at least 37 military operations in 14 countries, many of which were entirely unrelated to 9-11. A federal court in Washington, D.C., has blocked President Trump's directive banning transgender troops from serving in the U.S. Armed Forces, pending further review by the courts. In a ruling, Judge Colleen Collar Cotelli said plaintiffs suing to overturn the order are likely to succeed. The judge also blasted President Trump for announcing the ban via Twitter. In Syria, a U.N. convoy reached the besieged Damascus suburb of Ghouta on Monday, carrying aid for tens of thousands of residents at risk of famine from a stifling government siege. This is Mark Lokrock, the U.N.'s humanitarian affairs and emergency relief coordinator. An alarming number of child malnutrition cases have been recorded there, and more than 400 people with health problems require medical evacuation. I join the call of the World Food Programme and others for unimpeded humanitarian access. That's the UN's Mark Lowcock. The UN said its shipment will provide relief to about 40,000 people, a small fraction of the estimated 350,000 Syrians in the area who've seen food, fuel and medicine cut off since government forces blocked access to smuggling tunnels earlier this year. In the Gaza Strip, at least eight Palestinians were killed Monday, as Israeli forces blew up a tunnel connecting the besieged Palestinian territory to a kibbutz in southern Israel. The Palestinian Ministry of Health said most of the dead were members of the Al-Quds Brigade's militant group. The attack drew a threat of retaliation by the Islamic Jihad movement and was condemned by Hamas, which called it a new war against the people of Gaza. The tunnel attack came just days before Hamas is due to relinquish power to the West Bank-based Palestinian Authority as part of an agreement aimed at ending a decade-old split between Hamas and its political rival Fatah. Meanwhile, White House senior adviser Jared Kushner has returned home from a secret trip to the Middle East. Kushner went to Saudi Arabia, where he met privately with members of the royal family in what the White House says was a trip aimed at brokering a peace deal between Israel and the Palestinians. Spain's top prosecutor has called for the arrest of Carlos Puigdemont and other Catalan leaders on charges of rebellion, sedition and embezzlement. Puigdemont appeared in Belgium after the charges were announced, vowing to continue his fight for a separate Catalan nation, after Catalonia's regional parliament voted Friday for independence by a margin of 70 votes to 10. Puigdemont has hired a Belgian lawyer and may be considering an asylum claim in Belgium, where courts have a high bar for extradition requests. In Kenya, incumbent President Uhuru Kenyatta has claimed victory in election rerun that saw his main opponent boycott the election over charges of electoral fraud. Kenyatta took 98 percent of last Thursday's vote, with only 39 percent of eligible Kenyans casting ballots. Authorities called off the revote in 25 of Kenya's 290 electoral districts amid street protests and blockades by supporters of opposition leader Rela Odin who called the election a sham and called for a third vote within the next 90 days. On Monday, Amnesty International condemned instances of brutality and unlawful killing by authorities against opposition protesters, saying police fired indiscriminately into crowds and even broke into the homes of suspected protest organizers. The U.S. Navy says it's investigating whether two members of its elite SEAL team, six, were responsible for killing a Green Beret at the U.S. Embassy in Mali last June. Army Staff Sergeant Logan Melgar was found strangled to death in his room at the embassy in the capital, Bamako, where he was assigned to train Malian forces in counterinsurgency. 
The investigation of Melgar's death comes as the Trump administration expands the role of AFRICOM across the African continent. In Paris, activists disrupted the opening of an exhibition honoring Hollywood filmmaker Roman Polanski, who's accused of a string of sexual assaults and is wanted in the U.S. on charges he raped a 13-year-old girl in 1977. This is protester Sadio Rao. I think it's ridiculous that we're still venerating someone like him. I think it's ridiculous that he hasn't left France, that he's not in jail, that no one is taking the cases of these women seriously. So I'm here to give a voice and fight for that, so we take these women seriously for once. The protest came after thousands demonstrated in cities across France over the weekend, inspired by the hashtag MeToo, in which women share their stories of sexual assault and harassment. The protest came as France's Minister for Gender Equality pressed for legislation that would fine men who caught call, harass or follow women on the street. Back in the U.S., Hollywood actor Kevin Spacey has apologized for an incident three decades ago in which he made a sexual advance on actor Anthony Rapp, who at the time was 14 years old. In a statement, Spacey said he couldn't remember the 1986 incident, but apologized for deeply inappropriate drunken behavior. Kevin Spacey used the statement to come out as a gay man, drawing fire from LGBTQ activists who blasted him for conflating homosexuality with child molestation. Netflix said Monday it has canceled its popular House of Cards series, saying it was deeply troubled by Kevin Spacey's actions. The United Nations warned Monday carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere soared to a record 403.3 parts per million last year, jumping at the fastest annual rate ever recorded. It's a level the planet hasn't seen since the Pliocene epoch three million years ago, when sea levels were about 66 feet higher. The report by the World Meteorological Association, the World Meteorological Organization, came as representatives from nearly 200 countries are set to meet in Bonn, Germany, next week, for two weeks of talks aimed at curbing the worst effects of climate change. Democracy Now! will broadcast daily from the talks in Bonn throughout the week, beginning November 13th. Human rights campaigners rallied outside the White House Monday, calling on the Trump administration to release children and their parents from the Berks County Residential Center in Pennsylvania, the detention facility where families are imprisoned as they seek asylum in the U.S. Protesters with Amnesty International set up a cardboard silhouettes of children and teddy bears draped in signs reading, Don't Let Kids Grow Up in Jail. Amnesty's protest came as the American Civil Liberties Union demanded the release, immediately, of a 10-year-old girl who was taken into custody by Border Patrol agents as she was recovering from emergency surgery at a hospital in Texas. Video shows the agents escorting Rosa Maria Hernandez, who is undocumented, into custody as the 10-year-old girl is wheeled out of the hospital on a gurney. Hernandez has been living in the United States since she was three months old, when her parents moved to the U.S. in order to access better medical care to treat her cerebral palsy. We'll have more on her case later in the broadcast. And these are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. President Donald Trump's former campaign chair, Paul Manafort, and Manafort's former business associate, Rick Gates, surrendered to authorities Monday morning after a federal grand jury handed down the first indictments in special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into Russia's alleged interference in the 2016 presidential election. Manafort and Gates pleaded not guilty to all charges filed against them in a 12-count indictment, which included money laundering, acting as unregistered agents of Ukraine's former pro-Russian government, and conspiracy against the United States. Authorities also announced a third former Trump adviser, George Papadopoulos, had pleaded guilty in early October to lying to the FBI. White House spokesperson Sarah Sanders said Monday the indictments have nothing to do with the president's campaign or campaign activities.
The real collusion scandal, as we've said several times before, has everything to do with the Clinton campaign, Fusion GPS, and Russia. There's clear evidence of the Clinton campaign colluding with Russian intelligence to spread disinformation and smear the president to influence the election. We've been saying from day one there's been no evidence of Trump-Russia collusion, and nothing in the indictment today changes that at all. President Trump responded to news of the indictments on Twitter by lashing out against his former campaign rival Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party. He wrote, quote, sorry, but this is years ago before Paul Manafort was part of the Trump campaign, but why aren't crooked Hillary and the Dems the focus? Also, there is no collusion. The president's tweets came before news broke of, of George Papadopoulos' indictment, and Trump has not tweeted since then. Meanwhile, Democratic leaders warned the White House against firing special counsel Mueller. Uh, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer said in a statement, quote, Congress must respond swiftly and unequivocally in a bipartisan way to assure that the investigation will continue, end of quote. Manafort's bail was set at $10 million, Gates set at $5 million. They've both been placed under house arrest. Meanwhile, observers are closely watching the case against George Papadopoulos, an early foreign policy adviser to Trump's 2016 campaign, who may provide greater evidence of possible collusion between the Russian government and the Trump campaign. According to his plea deal, Papadopoulos was told that the Russians had dirt on Hillary Clinton, and through a series of communications with foreign agents, he tried to facilitate communication between the Trump campaign and Russian agents. Papadopoulos was arrested in July 2017, has been cooperating with federal authorities since then, striking a plea deal earlier this month. The plea deal was just announced after the indictments about against Manafort and Gates. For more, we're joined by Marcy Wheeler in Michigan, an independent journalist who covers national security and civil liberties. She runs the website EmptyWheel.net. And her new piece for The Intercept is headlined, George Papadopoulos' indictment is very, very bad news for Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Uh, Marcy, welcome back to Democracy Now! Well, why don't you start with the indictments against uh, the chairman of Donald Trump's campaign, Manafort, and Manafort's business executive, Gates. Talk about their significance and whether they relate to collusion. Well, they're designed to get them to flip. So, in other words, um, Mueller has been targeting Manafort for quite some time. I think Gates was actually a bit surprised that he was indicted yesterday. And what he has done is charge them with, with uh, crimes that are fairly con controllable. I mean, they don't involve colluding with a foreign, you know, with Russia, for example. Um, such that they will be enticed to make a plea deal, just as Papadopoulos did, and provide more information about what Mueller is really investigating, which is whether or not the Trump campaign, uh, for example, was trying to work with Russian agents on June 9th, 2016, when they agreed to take a meeting to find dirt on Hillary Clinton. So. Um, it's mostly garden variety money laundering, although fairly spectacular garden variety money laundering. Uh, uh, Manafort was charged of laundering a million dollars through the local antique rug shop. Um, there's also a scheme going back to 2012 where Manafort and Gates were both pretending not to be lobbying on whether or not Ukraine was democratic and pro-EU and getting, incidentally, Tony Podesta, John Podesta, uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign advisor's brother, to lobby on his behalf while hiding that they were actually lobbying. And that's, that's the big thing that gets Gates. Um, but again, the idea is to get them to make a plea deal so that then Mueller can get them to provide more evidence on the, the, the case in chief, on, on the way in which the Trump administration, or the Trump campaign, was, was uh, trying to reach out to the Russians. And Marcy Wheeler, the, the issue of Gates also being indicted, and as you have pointed out in some of, uh, some of your articles, uh, Manafort was only a chair of the campaign for a short period of time in 2016, but Gates stayed on and actually was involved in the Trump campaign even through the inauguration, uh, his inauguration as president. The significance of Gates being included in this indictment. Well, I made a joke this morning. Um, Mueller's deputy, Andrew Weissman, is fairly well known for indicting the target and the target's family member. 
Manafort's had some marital problems recently, so I joked this morning that rather than indicting Manafort's wife, who legitimately could have been tied to some of these because she, her name is on the business as well, he instead uh, indicted Manafort's long-term business partner, Gates, to make him uh, feel like he was dragging somebody else into, into, the, into the dirt. And so, but you're right, uh, Gates, in the Papadopoulos plea deal, there is, there is an interchange between Manafort and Gates pertaining to whether or not the uh, campaign was going to try and set up a meeting with Vladimir Putin. And Gates will have been in a lot of these conversations all the way through the inauguration. So he knows some stuff that, that uh, Man Manafort was ousted in, in August, although he stayed close to Trump and has, you know, was speaking to Trump as recently as February. But Gates was there in the White House as part of the transition, and so we'll have, have dirt of his own to um, deal with, uh, with, with Special Counsel Mueller. So let's talk about George Papadopoulos and the significance here. Um, he was, what, arrested the day after um, Manafort's house was raided. Uh, he pled guilty October 5th, but it was only announced yesterday. Trump tweeted, you know, after Manafort Gates' um, indictments, uh, this shows no collusion, which he was right about with Manafort and Gates. This was before, right, um, uh, they worked for him. But when the Papadopoulos plea deal was announced, Trump stopped tweeting altogether and then went to lunch with Jeff Sessions, his attorney general. So talk about George Papadopoulos, Jeff Sessions, and the significance of what Papadopoulos uh, knows. So Papadopoulos uh, was living in London. He was basically, it's quite clear from the, from the plea, he was being courted by, by Russian handlers, by three different Russian handlers, uh, to set up a meeting they, they wanted to set up a meeting between Putin and Trump, and as the summer went on, uh, Papadopoulos and Manafort were going to be the ones who went for the meeting. There, as I said, there is a footnote in the plea that shows Manafort talking to Gates and saying, we need to avoid kind of making it clear that we're kind of cozying up to the Russians here. So um, the other really important thing, which isn't really in the plea agreement, but we know is part of the discussions that Papadopoulos has been having since July with Mueller's people, and that is that um, he was accused of lying about whether, about what he took this reference from the Russians to mean, that they had dirt on Hillary Clinton in the, in the form of thousands of emails. And uh, it is clear that they have accused him of lying about when he learned about that, but the rest is kind of silent, which is, which is the beauty of this plea agreement, because it's designed to get everyone panicking, because they don't know what Papadopoulos has said. But, but the suggestion there is that by April, actually three days before the DNC realized that they were being hacked by the Russians, Papadopoulos knew that the Russians had thousands of Hillary emails that they were seeking to drop as dirt, as, as um, oppo for this campaign. And, and it was very clear that he kept in touch with everyone else on the campaign. So in addition to Manafort and Gates, who aren't named, but we know from other reporting that, that they're included, Corlin Lewandowski, who was, who was also uh, a campaign chair and, and remained on the campaign, um, uh, a guy by the name of Sam Clovis, who has a confirmation hearing coming up on November 9th for the Ag Department. And then most importantly, on March 31, um, Papadopoulos was in a meeting, there's a picture of this, um, with both, with a bunch of foreign policy advisors, but it, it includes Jeff Sessions, now the Attorney General, and Trump. And at that meeting, he said, my job is to set up a meeting with Vladimir Putin. Um, and as you said, Trump got really silent yesterday after this was released, but uh, Sanders was saying, well, you know, Trump doesn't remember Russia coming up in that meeting. Uh, Sessions hasn't said anything about it, but the point I made yesterday is that in testimony on the 18th, uh, Sessions said he knew nothing about any campaign surrogates talking to Russians. Now we know he was in a meeting where he heard about a meeting with, with Vladimir Putin. So his sworn testimony from two weeks ago seems, as always is the case with Attorney General Sessions, seems to be no longer operative and proven yet again to be untrue. And, and Marcy, I think that, that isn't the Times reporting today that in one of these meetings that Sessions uh, especially uh, said that 
this kind of meeting would not happen between uh, certainly between the, the candidate himself uh, and uh, any uh, any uh, Russian leaders. So uh, clearly, he had to have uh, some knowledge of of what the information that Papadopoulos was gathering beforehand. Right. At the very beginning of their discussions about foreign policy, and this is, this is again, quite clear from the, from the plea agreement, the Papadopoulos plea agreement, that a priority for the Trump campaign was to make friends with Russia. And at this meeting, and again, there's, there's a picture floating out there with, like, uh, eight different campaign people and the president, the now president, um, at that meeting, Papadopoulos said, my job is to go set up a meeting between you, Donald Trump, and, and Vladimir Putin. And Vladimir Putin is very much looking forward to that. And, th and the important point about that is from March on, right, March, there's that meeting. April, Papadopoulos learns about the email. That really influences the mindset of everybody who was in that June 9th, 2016 meeting. Uh, with a Russian lawyer and a bunch of other Russians, where they offered dirt on Hillary Clinton. Because we know that at least one person on the campaign, and probably a lot more, knew two months earlier that the dirt was not political donations going back years, but instead emails that were stolen from Hillary Clinton. So that really changes the mindset, particularly for Paul Manafort, right, because he would have been in the loop, and he was in that June 9th meeting. That would change the mindset of what everyone who took that June 9th meeting was doing. So, <clears throat> this indictment is called Indictment B, right? So, who mm -hmm. is Indictment A? We have no idea. The, the, the docket, uh, just chronologically before the Manafort Gates docket, is also sealed. So, it is possible somebody else got, got um, indicted. And given that we don't know about it, if that is the case, then that person may be cooperating. Um, it, it could actually be Tony Podesta. As I said, uh, John Podesta, Hillary Clinton's campaign advisor, he stepped down from his own um, influence peddling firm, or lobbyist firm, as they're called. But they're both, I mean, he's just as, he's kind of the Democratic sleazy counterpart of Paul Manafort. So he stepped down because of, of this corruption. He has been named a subject in the investigation. So it's not outside the realm of possibility that he was also charged. Um, there's this funny thing about these indictments yesterday where uh, Manafort's lawyer actually said, how dare the special counsel uh, prosecute somebody for violating the, the Foreign uh, Agents Registration Act, because it hasn't been treated as a law for a very long time in D.C. And I think on top of everything else, I think a lot of lobbyists in D.C. are going to start admitting the, the kind of sleazy influence peddling they've been doing, because now uh, Robert Mueller is going after it. So, uh, Tony Podesta is an outside possibility for that. Another possibility is Mike Flynn, because the charges that he would be offered as a first indictment to get him to flip are all the same ones that Manafort would be, that he hadn't registered as a foreign agent, uh, both for Turkey and for Russia, and that he hadn't uh, disclosed all of his income on his taxes. So. It's possible. We don't know. Um, you know, hopefully we'll find out. But, but again, th what, what happened yesterday was by design uh, intended to get the people who are named in the Papadopoulos plea and everybody else who knows that they've been in conversations with these people to start panicking, to start and, and, thinking and more Wheeler, seriously. I, I wanted to ask you about one other aspect of, of what happened yesterday, mm -hmm. the civil forfeiture of uh, 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 attempts by the federal government against Manafort. What does, what's the significance of that, going after his assets as well? Plus the $10 million bail. Right. So um, there were millions, I think $18 million of money laundered funds brought into the United States. There's the rugs, there's the suits. And all of that, because it is the fruits of the crimes alleged in the indictment, all of that is now forfeitable. Um, including a number of homes, not all of them. But what that serves to do is basically bankrupt Manafort, who is already known to be in a significant amount of debt. So it makes, I mean, he's already paid millions to his lawyers. It makes it a lot harder for him to mount a defense because he no longer has any liquid assets to pay lawyers out of. And, and that's the kind of, I mean, this is an object lesson for everyone else that says, plea early 
or you're going to be in much worse straits because you're not going to have the money and the charges are going to start getting worse and it's going to be, you know, it's going to get increasingly difficult to, to get yourself out of the pinch. Marcy Willer, in 10 seconds, did anything shock you yesterday? No, but I think everyone in D.C. was surprised that Mueller was able to uh, get this guy to take a plea agreement on October 5th and keep it silent till now. So what shocked me is just how well he's keeping secrets. Marcy Wheeler, thanks so much for being with us. Independent journalist who covers national security and civil liberties issues, runs the website EmptyWheel.net. Her new piece is for The Intercept. It's headlined, and we'll link to it, George Papadopoulos's indictment is very, very bad news for Attorney General Jeff Sessions. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, well, we're just back from Puerto Rico, and now, reportedly, the FBI is investigating the $300 million Whitefish energy deal. Will it be killed altogether? We'll be back with the mayor of San Juan. Stay with us. Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We turn now to Puerto Rico, where United Nations experts are warning of alarming conditions now more than five weeks after Hurricane Maria. In a report released Monday, U.N. experts also condemned the United States' handling of the disaster, saying the response was ineffective and that the mainland states of Florida and Texas had received far more support after being struck by hurricanes than Puerto Rico did. Uh, Le uh, Lailani Farha, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Housing, said, quote, we can't fail to note the dissimilar urgency and priority given to the emergency response in Puerto Rico compared to the United States, to the U.S. states affected by hurricanes in recent months. This comes, as The Wall Street Journal is reporting, the FBI is investigating the $300 million contract between Puerto Rico's electrical power company, known as PREPA, and the tiny Montana-based Montana company Whitefish, which is linked to Interior, Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke. I mean, that's his hometown. On Sunday, under enormous pressure, Puerto Rico's governor, Ricardo Rosselló, instructed Puerto Rico's power company to cancel the controversial contract with Whitefish Energy. Well, we were there in Puerto Rico when um, that was announced. But our first stop on Friday afternoon was the Roberto Clemente Coliseum, where the San Juan mayor, Carmen Yulín Cruz, and her vice mayor, Rafael Jaume, were analyzing the details of two contracts, yes, the $300 million deal with Whitefish, and another $200 million contract between the power company and Cobra, which is an Oklahoma-based Based company. Now, we had actually come into the Roberto Clemente Coliseum because there had been a news conference um, that the San Juan mayor held with Bernie Sanders, who had come into town for a few hours to express solidarity with the mayor and the people of Puerto Rico. And afterwards, I got to sit down with the San Juan mayor. But just as we finished this interview, the vice mayor came in with the contracts and all of the caveats, and they were just shocked. So you just got a hold of the um, both the whitefish contract and the cobra co co contract. Both of them this morning we got three hundred million dollar contract and for the whitefish. Two hundred million, two hundred million for cobra million for both. an Oklahoma yes. based company. And, and this is FEMA's statement from yeah, this it morning. Was FEMA's statement on this morning says clearly the decision to award a contract to Whitefield Energy was made exclusively by Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority, PREPA. FEMA was not involved in the selection. 
Questions regarding the awarding of this contract should be directed to PREPA. Following says, any language in any contract between PREPA and Whitefish that states FEMA approved that contract is inaccurate. Mm. Strong words. What about, I'll tell you this one. And this is a this part is of the Article contract. 59 in Whitefield, Whitefish contract. It says, in the event shall PREPA. In no event. In no event shall PREPA, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the FEMA administration, the Comptroller General of the United States, or any other authorized representative have the right to audit or review the cost and profit elements of the labor rates specified herein. That is, you can read it by yourself. That's mm -hmm. it. There's no well, other thing that, that's black and white. And this? And this one says, this is Article 68, penalties, fines, and the allowed costs. Disallowed costs. Disallowed costs. By executing this contract, PREPA hereby represents and warns that FEMA has reviewed and approved of this contract and confirmed that the contract is in acceptable form to qualify for funding from FEMA and other U.S. government agencies. Totally the opposite in contrast what, FEMA, what is FEMA is saying. You know what that means? That means that right there, that contract is null and void. Yes. It contradicts the laws of the United States of America, and it should be voided right now by the Puerto Rican government. And if the Puerto Rican government does not have the nerve to do what they have to do in order to do things right, then the U.S. government should do it. Because what this means is that we will not get reimbursed mm -hmm. for a $300 million contract awarded to a two-employee company that did not have the expertise nor business getting into this business. Mm. FEMA says PREPA wholly approved this. Yes. Yeah. Um, PREPA, of course, is the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority. Mm -hmm. Did PREPA approve this? Mm -hmm. it, it, PREPA approved it. I have asked for, uh, actually, the director of PREPA signed it. Yeah, I have asked for PREPA to release the minutes of the meeting where this was discussed, but certainly FEMA did not approve this. That means we are not going to get reimbursed by this. Mm -hmm. And by declaring that, in fact, FEMA approved it, they were lying when they signed the contract. Mm -hmm. The head of PREPA was lying. Both parties. Both parties. Because if I was getting a $300 million contract based on the fact that I would get reimbursed by um, FEMA, I would have liked that in writing. Amounts much less than that and decisions much less than that. Um, I've said no until I have it in writing. So that, that is null and void right there. Mm. Right there. There is nothing. You cannot tell a governmental entity that you cannot audit a contract, that you have no right to uh, request a time frame, and you cannot represent things that are not true in contracts. That is just basics of contract law. So this right here, it's null and void. So you want this, do you want the Whitefish contract nullified? It, it should be nullified. It is scandalous. It is an affront uh, on our people. And frankly, again, when I called for this two days ago, their response from the Whitefish Twitter was threatening to take away the 44 uh, men and women, I don't know if they have women working, they said men, and 40 more that were coming that day. So they have 84 people working in San Juan, which is uh, the largest city in, in Puerto Rico. Not only that, now I, want, I would want to know, what is the work plan? Well, they don't have to have a work plan. You know why? Because in the contract, it states that they don't have to finish anytime soon. So this is a gift of $300 million to two people. That, that's what this amounts to. Do you think the head of PREPA should be fired? Yes. He should have been fired a long time ago. A long time ago. What is beyond me is why the governor continues to say that this man has his support. And the head of PREPA is? Ricardo Ramos. Very, 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 very ineffective. Uh, very inappropriate, 
and frankly, somebody that doesn't even know what he's signing. And the other contract, this is a $300 million contract, then there's a $200 million with Cobra, what's that, called Cobra that one, contract? That one, I haven't uh, had a chance to look at it. We, we got it this morning, we went to the controller's office. This so, also signed by the head of PREPA? Um, yes. yes, also signed by the head of PREPA. So, it's, it's very interesting because when you look at these contracts, uh, they're already, some of them, I don't know if it's, uh, I think it's this one, already has uh, addendums to it. They, they yeah, have already been changes. They've already been changes. You, you haven't even started. Per, these are the rates per hours, $400, 500 per no, hour. No, COBRA is an Oklahoma-based yes, contract. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any relationship between Scott Pruitt, who's the former Oklahoma Attorney General and now I, the head I, of the Environmental Protection I don't, Agency. I don't know either. but. What I do know is that two and three is five, and there's $500 million in here, uh, one of which is utterly uh, null and void, and, and it's, you know, very difficult to understand that in the United States, contractual law would allow one of the parties to be taken for a ride, because this is, <laughs> this prep up, contract is um, so odious and so not good for the Puerto Rican people. You're holding the white fish contract. Yes, yes. Um, and not only that, look, it was signed October 17th. This, I have the page this morning, October 17th. This is a $300 million contract, I hope to God that it has a lot more than these little tiny pages that we have here. Because it's, uh, it's unnerving. It's, 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 it truly is unnerving, you know, that people can just swindle, swindle an entire population when they are at its most vulnerable. So that's San Juan's mayor, Carmen Yulín Cruz, and San Juan's vice mayor, Rafael Halme. We were in the Roberto Clemente Coliseum, where the entire mayor's staff is staying. It has electricity. Most of Puerto Rico, the overwhelming number um, population of Puerto Rico, does not have it. It was the room in which she had just had her news conference with uh, Senator Bernie Sanders and union leaders, decrying what was happening right now in Puerto Rico and the uh, U.S. government's response. But they're standing there, uh, just having gotten the actual paper contracts of both Whitefish Energy, the $300 million contract that was signed by Ricardo Ramos, who is head of PREPA, uh, the Puerto Rican um, power authority, the largest power authority, public power authority in the United States, and the COBRA contract, which isn't talked about as much, the COBRA contract to Oklahoma-based company for $200 million. Juan, you've been following this very closely. Uh, well, Amy, yes, uh, I, I raised a couple of weeks ago this whole issue of the of this whitefish contract. And the problem is that uh, the pillaging of Puerto Rico is still continuing, uh, even in the midst of this enormous crisis. Uh, not only is this uh, contract with Whitefish indefensible, the rates that they were paying private contractors, essentially, to do work that uh, Puerto Rico electrical workers could uh, could be doing or that electrical workers from other uh, parts of the United States could be doing from utilities. but. There was pillaging going on beforehand. Uh, most people are not aware. This guy, Ricardo Ramos, was appointed as the head of PREPA just in February by the new governor. He's only been in office a, a few months. And uh, use and, that time now to sign these contracts. Uh, and before that, uh, there was a, a woman named Lisa Donahue, who had been the Donna. well, Donahue, uh, who was the chief restructuring officer of PREPA. She had been brought in uh, about a year and a half earlier to restructure all the debt of PREPA. She never was able to finally get a, a final deal on, on, with the bondholders on PREPA, but yet she walked away uh, in February 
with $46 million for 18 months of work, her and her uh, the other partners in her firm that were brought in to restructure uh, Puerto Rico's debt. $46 million for 18 months of work. Uh, this is the kind of— And let's of, remember, PREPA is bankrupt. Right. It's bank the, fir the firm is bankrupt, but that doesn't mean that there's still not cash coming in, <laughs> cash coming in from the rates that utility uh, users are paying, customers are paying. So there's a huge cash flow. The question is, where does the money go? And this example of these kinds contracts now in the midst of this uh, of this enormous uh, calamity uh, in Puerto Rico is an example of how the money is being wasted and it's being wasted now supposedly when PREPA is not only uh, under new management, but is also under oversight of the U.S. Uh, board, Fiscal Control Board. The, this kind of money, the Fiscal Control Board also has to approve these kinds of major expenditures. Well, we're going to go to break and then come back to my conversation with the San Juan Mayor, Carmen Yulín Cruz. This is Democracy Now! Again, the FBI is now investigating how this whitefish deal that the Puerto Rican government says they're in the process of canceling uh, was accomplished. Stay with us. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. As we turn right now to my interview with the Puerto Rican mayor, uh, Carmen Yulín Cruz, uh, the uh, mayor I spoke with on Friday, we sat down together in the, um, in the Roberto Clemente Coliseum, where the entire mayoral staff is now living. Um, I began by asking her how Hurricane Maria has changed Puerto Rico since it struck the island September 20th. I think September 20th changed the Puerto Rican reality forever. Uh, we live in a different San Juan and a different Puerto Rico, not because of what we're lacking. The majority of the uh, island is still without any power. Uh, only about 40 to 60 percent of the population has water. That doesn't mean that it's good water. Uh, we still have to boil it or put chlorine in it to be able to drink it. Uh, medical services are really, really bad because of the lack of electricity. Uh, the supplies in the supermarkets are not there yet, so people are having a lot of trouble getting the supplies that they need. Uh, but still, the fierce determination of people has not dwindled. And, and to me, that's been a, a very, um, I would say, a big lesson uh, to learn. Can you talk about this public power company, the largest in the United States? Do you think there's an effort in this time, uh, in the aftermath of the hurricane, of um, an effort to just privatize it? Yes. For it totally yes. to fail? And what yes. do you think has to be done about uh, that? It, it cannot be privatized. Uh, I am, and a lot of people, totally against, because it, the, we are 100 miles long by 35 miles wide. That's a monopoly. It doesn't matter how you want to uh, disguise it, it's a monopoly. And what we're doing is we're putting in private hands the decision as to where our economic development is spread, where the sense of equality or inequality will happen. So power isn't just about the power grid, it's also about the ability that the Puerto Rican people may have in the years to come to ensure that there is appropriate uh, economic development and equally divided amongst all the 78 municipalities in Puerto Rico. Disaster capitalism, what does that term mean to you? And do you think that's happening here, using a crisis to accomplish something that couldn't be accomplished otherwise? Uh, you know, I wish I had never been introduced to that term. Uh, also, the shock, shock treatment, right? Using the chaos to strip employees of their bargaining rights, rights that took 40, 50 years for the unions to uh, be able to determine. That is something very important. And um, it just means taking advantage of people when they are in a life or death situation. It is the most, an absolute mistreatment of human rights. It means that the strongest 
really feed off the weakest until everything that's left is the carcass. And what we cannot understand is why. Because that is so against the American spirit that we see. We have had him send one more than 500 volunteers in a span of four weeks, coming here, leaving their homes, uh, taking their vacation, nurses, teamsters, AFL, CIO, UFCW, Leona workers, um, just leaving their homes. I met a person from California that sold their Harley Davidson. I mean, sold their Harley Davidson to come to San Juan and help <laughs> for two weeks. Uh, you have, you know, the United States has a big heart. Um, you know what it is to help those in need. And then the central government, the federal government in the United States seems to be just playing a totally different tune. This, this, this slowness, this total pace uh, of just getting relief to people, life and death relief to people, it's unthinkable. You mentioned death. Um, as we flew in here, we heard about bodies being incinerated at morgues that are not counted. Do you actually know the death toll right now, and is no. that happening? No, we don't know. Uh, it has been reported that 911 deaths have been, uh, or bodies have been cremated since Maria. Why is that happening? 911. 911. Why is that happening? We have no idea. You know, usually when you cremate people at that rate, it's because you're trying to uh, ensure that an outbreak of whatever disease doesn't come out. But whatever it is, we should know about it. Um, and again, I don't understand why these things are not being openly talked about. Let's go back to when President Trump attacked you. Um, I think it shocked many people because by then people had heard of you. You were a familiar image across our TV screens as you were, what, waist, chest high in water with your bullhorn helping to save people mm -hmm. and evacuate people. So that's the uh, mayor of San Juan that we became familiar with. And then you have the president of the United States. Um, attacking you. Um, what was the quote? Um, first, you had uh, the acting head of the Department of Homeland Security um, talking about— Said this that this was a good news story. story. No, that really, that really, uh, that really, I don't know if I can say the word on TV, but it, it really upset me. Because this was not, this is, this has never been a good news story. When devastation hits and people are dying because they don't have dialysis, appropriate medical care, or food and water, whose mind and whose heart would call this a good news story? Um, so I, I hadn't actually heard her say that, um, and I've actually met her twice after that, and we've had good meetings. Um, good things have come from those meetings. Uh, but to me, at that moment, it was like a total lack of connection with reality, maybe in Trumpville or in Mar-a-Lago. So President Trump says the mayor of San Juan, who was very complimentary of only a few days ago, has now been told by the Democrats you must be nasty to Trump. He tweeted this um, from his Bedminster Golf Resort in New Jersey and went on to say such poor leadership ability by the mayor of San Juan and others in Puerto Rico who are not able to get their workers to help. They want everything to be done for them when it should be a community effort. You know what, what I thought, poor guy. Poor guy. You know, it must be very difficult to live in a world where reality is very different to what you want it to be. And it's very easy to try to change the dialogue when you're failing. It's less like when he get himself a 10. Well, if it's a 10 out of 100, I agree, because it's still a failing grade. Can you tell us what your meeting with him was like when President Trump came here? What we saw is the president um, hurling rolls of paper towels at hurricane survivors. Yeah, uh, what I heard was a president disconnected with reality and not representing the real values of the American people. A man that said, this is not a real catastrophe. Now, Katrina, that was a real catastrophe. He has then uh, rescinded what he says. You know, he says one thing one day, he says another thing another day. It's very hard to keep up. 
uh, with the man, um, and who wants to, anyway. But it was, he tried to avoid me. Uh, you know, I'm small, so it's easy for him. Where were you? Um, I was sitting in a corner. Where, where? Oh, this, this was at the uh, uh, Munoz Marin uh, Air Force Base. And, um, you know, I went because you have to respect the presidency. And I went because I represent 350,000 people in San Juan. Um, if it would have been him and me, I would have not wasted my time. But uh, in a democracy, you have to respect uh, the leadership, even though you don't see eye to eye with the person. So he finally, you can see in the picture, he, he had to very lean over because he was so far away from me. So he had to reach out. And I said, it's not about, it's about saving lives, Mr. President. It's not about politics. And he looked over me and said, well, thank you, everybody. And I, I kind of chuckled um, because if that didn't bother him, he would have said, I agree with you, right? But because it bothered him, then he didn't say anything. So all he did was, it was a feast of accolades to himself. Oh, we've done such a good job with the Coast Guard, and we've done such a good, and you know, in the meantime, I have a mayor sitting next to me saying, well, let him come to my town. And, and really, the reality is not, have things gotten better in San Juan? Yes. In the past week and a half, FEMA has responded more um, equitably. And a lot of it has to do with local politics. You know? And I have to say, uh, after my second meeting with Secretary Duke, and uh, he left John Barca here to uh, be our connection with FEMA, he's from Homeland Security, things got better. Are they where they're supposed to be? No. Can I see the light at the end of the tunnel? A week ago, I could imagine it, now I can see, but that is not the situation for most of the other 77 municipalities in Puerto Rico. And I'm not going to be such a bad Puerto Rican that I'm gonna say, oh, things, as long as they're good for me, then they're good for the world. Because then I would become Donald Trump, and heaven forbid, I should ever be like that man. You clearly came into office with the support of many unions. Yes. Um, in fact, when we flew in from the airport today and you were holding a news conference with Bernie Sanders, there were representatives of a number of unions. Um, and among them were the electrical workers. Mm -hmm. And they talked about the power company. There's been discussions about whether you could transform this largest uh, public power company in the country that has had the biggest shortage and blackout of electricity that we've ever seen in this mm -hmm. country as a possibly test case where you start to use solar power. Yes. Well, what about this? What do you see happening? Do you see this as an attempt to privatize or do you see creative ways that um, Puerto Rico could move forward and be a pioneer in solar well, energy? Well, there are creative ways. Tesla has already come to Puerto Rico and done a humanitarian uh, uh, work at the Children's Hospital where they have energized it with solar panels. I mean, th this is a, a Caribbean island. Uh, you know, we get lots, lots and lots of sun. So we should be able to uh, reach goals that are increasing every year to uh, move away from our addiction of fossil fuel to non-fossil fuel. And we should also be able to energize communities just using solar power and perhaps some wind power if it's if it's appropriate. But for the first time, at least I heard today, the president of the um, power company saying that they of are the union. of the union saying that they are looking forward to transforming the system and moving towards a better mix of of uh, regular our grid and and. Uh, solar power energy, and that was very refreshing to hear. So for those of them that say, no, no, the unions just want to keep us uh, one step behind, it's not true. Th that's just, again, you change the dialogue, you attack, so as to not to be able to defend. It's a lot easier to attack somebody than to defend what you believe in. San Juan Mayor's Carmen Yulin Cruz.